My teacher tip for you today is essentially a paradigm shift from the traditional model of assessment to a truly transformative model that puts students in the driver's seat. It's where success is highly differentiated and defined by mastery of skills, language acquisition, and proficiency growth, and where the focus is on the student's individualized journey, where mistakes, risk-taking, and creativity are highly encouraged, and where the focus is on what they can do. And then through that process, we build better relationships for that truly transformative experience. As I present today, I'd like for you to take a look at this spectrum, and I'd like for you to consider where you think the model that I'm going to share with you today falls on this spectrum. And I'd also like for you to consider your own practices, beliefs, um, and curriculum and assessments, and consider where they fall perhaps on this spectrum. Um, I'm going to assume, as I present to you today, that you also possess some sort of working knowledge around ACTFL's proficiency guidelines, as well as their oral proficiency interview. I will break things down a bit, and I'm going to do so using probably different language than ACTFL would use, with some modifications that I use with my students. And remember that ACTFL defines interpersonal speaking proficiency as spontaneous, non-targeted communication covering a variety of topics. Um, I think of it as spontaneous, non-targeted communication, but I try not to get too hung up on how many topics we cover per assessment because, one, I just simply have limited time. Two, um, I assess my students a number of times over the course of the year. And three, I want to be able to take some creative liberties because um, I want this quote-unquote test to eliminate things like a predefined notion of success. I want to create a safe space for students and from selfishly for myself to be able to create, to be able to feel comfortable and confident to be spontaneous, thus eliminating that need to check off boxes. Um, and ultimately, I want students to walk away really saying like, wow, that was so easy because I believe that when students feel successful, it leads to them being successful. Uh, something else that I'd like to mention in case you are interested is that I created this assessment after attending an OWL training, otherwise known as the Organic World Language Teaching Methodology. The training was inspirational. It helped me to completely revamp my entire curriculum, which spurred me to rethink my assessments. This is not officially an OWL assessment. It is just something that was inspired uh, by this life-changing experience and the skills that I acquired after attending their boot camp. Uh, this is just an agenda of the things that I plan to cover with you today. Um, something noteworthy to point out in terms of the modifications that I made to ACTL's proficiency levels is I didn't like the wording of low, um, so I instead decided to call it one, and then to make it consistent, I made everything one, two, and three. Uh, so you'll hear me probably today say novice one or intermediate two, um, and that just correlates to the low, mid, and high. Um, I felt that this was important because I really wanted students not to be told that they were low. I didn't think that that was appropriate. And then um, I also wanted to think about how I could make these goals more tangible for students and how I could make the benchmarks more tangible. And so I looked at this section in particular and I said, I feel like that section really needs to be divided up. So as you look at the rubric, um, which will come up on the next uh, slide, you'll see that there are these almost categories, and that's where the almost idea was born um, to really make it tangible and um, accessible and um, just something that felt really achievable for the students. Um, Okay, so this is the novice rubric, and this rubric just simply came from ACTFL's proficiency guidelines. I didn't really change the wording, I don't think. Uh, I don't think I changed it much, if at all. Um, but I did maybe make some tweaks to try and make it a little bit more uh, comprehensible for the students. So um, I would like for you to take a look at the evolution of phrase from novice one to novice three. And if you need to pause it, please feel free to pause it before I give you the answer. 
here comes the answer. Uh, so novice one, they can use one or two highly practiced phrases. Novice two, they're using lots of memorized phrases. And novice three is known as the fallen angel, and that's because they uh, can start to perform at the intermediate level, but then fall. And so that's why they can sometimes create with sentences, and then they fall back to those phrases. This is both the novice and the intermediate rubric. And I'd like for you to pay attention to the boxes in blue um, and consider how does the role of the interlocutor change as students progress. So again, if you'd like to pause it here, please feel free to pause it. Um, at the beginning, they are heavily reliant on the interlocutor. Intermediate two, they're reliant. And as we go up to intermediate one, they become the least reliant. Um, this was something really, really alleviating for me because when I was more of a traditional teacher trying to break out of that but still not able to, um, I was frustrated by the idea that, you know, I taught them that. Why are they not able to do that independently? Um, why don't they seem to actually know it? And when students are speaking spontaneously, once we make that transition to the proficiency-oriented type model, uh, we start to learn that it's really normal for students to be reliant on us or on whoever they're speaking to or engaging with, especially in spontaneous communication. Um, so that was something really helpful for me and um, especially to consider also that even at the intermediate range, they're still going to be reliant on, on me if I'm the one conducting the oral proficiency interview with them. Um, this is the intermediate rubric, and I'd like for you to pay attention to the boxes in green. And for that part, I'd like for you to consider how does the level of the language change from the intermediate one to the intermediate two. And again, if you'd like to pause, please feel free to pause. The answer is that uh, at the intermediate one range, they start to be able to talk almost like in paragraphs because they can talk about one topic for sort of more of an extended period of time, maybe like five sentences or even more. Um, and it seems like it's a paragraph, but it's not because they you could take that paragraph and you could dissect it and put it back together and um, it would still make sense. Um, something else to consider is that students in at the intermediate one range are still speaking uh, in the present tense. And that was something for me that was a little bit shocking maybe, um, just considering that uh, we tend to think as teachers that students should progress faster than what they do. And um, it, it's alleviating to know that it's okay if they're still speaking in the present tense, they can be intermediate speakers. Um, intermediate two, now they can actually speak we're using more like transitions and uh, maybe like time indicators and then there's their paragraph becomes more paragraph like uh, it may not fully be a hundred percent paragraph like but it's it's that emerging paragraph um, and the other thing to take into consideration is that they are attempting the past tense and this is according to actful this is the first time that they're really truly attempting the past tense um, and not always doing so accurately. And so that was also something alleviating for me to consider that mistakes are okay. And um, now it's become a big part of my practice that mistakes are encouraged because mistakes help students grow. Um, and it, it's just an indicator of what their proficiency level might be. It doesn't mean that there's any such thing as points off with this type of assessment. So how do I actually conduct the modified oral proficiency interview? Um, I just start by saying, what's your name? Then I ask them to talk to me. Um, I ask them to talk about anything that they would like. Then I choose a topic that they have mentioned, and I try to dig deeper to determine their sustained proficiency level. Um, if they're novice, we're likely going to discuss a variety of topics. It's likely going to be superficial. If they're novice one, then we're probably not even having a um, 
truly inter exchange. It's more like an exchange of uh, information. It's not really a conversation. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And I know Axel wouldn't want this to be called a conversation, by the way. Um, but I, I like that because I like the idea that, it, you know, my students feel like we're just having a conversation. They don't necessarily know, um, as they're doing it, you know, how much structure I'm trying to use. I do share this with them though, so that they know what to expect. Um, the intermediates, they are likely now going to be able to discuss one topic more so at length. And so, um, the really cool thing about that is the other part is they're starting to gain this skill that's more of like a conversational skill. And so now they can take, uh, a couple of topics even and weave them together much more nicely than they did at the novice range. At the novice range, they tend to be very chunky. Um, and so that is interesting. The other thing is they're starting to build the skill of being able to ask embedded questions into the conversation. And um, I, I like to see them doing that and encourage them to do that because it shows that they're developing that skill. Um, but most of the time, most students don't ask enough questions embedded into the conversation. And so novice and intermediates oftentimes will be required to ask questions at the end. If I feel that they've asked enough questions, um, then I, I won't necessarily ask them to ask questions at the end. Um, I'd like to get at least three, at least three questions per conversation. Um, but if they, particularly if they are novice one, they are going to struggle to come up with questions, even if you have highly practiced questions um, during class time and, and all of that. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, if they're like, I just can't really think of any questions, then then maybe they're really being honest, and it's just it's okay. You don't have to keep on pushing them. Um, Okay, some other important notes to take into consideration about my version of the oral proficiency interview. I want to reduce their stress. I just, I don't want this to be a stressful thing for them. Um, so there are some things that we do every single day. Uh, we act, we draw, and we circumlocute every single day. So I feel that it matches to have the assessment um, to have that be a strategy that they can use during the assessment. So they are certainly encouraged if they get stuck to act and draw and circumlocution is just a skill that they need for language anyway. And so they are also encouraged to circumlocute if they need to. Um, they are in the driver's seat. So if they get stuck, they can change topics. That is, there's no such thing as you get points off because you got stuck or you get points off because you change topics. That is just an indicator of their proficiency level. Um, then there are a couple of other ways that I like to try and support them. I do adjust my level of speaking or my level of proficiency uh, to try and, you know, make it maybe just a tad bit above where they are performing at at the moment because if I'm speaking to them at a native level and they're novice or even sometimes intermediate ones, they can really struggle to comprehend that. And so I will adjust my, my level to make it more comprehensible for them. Um, and another thing that I'll do is I'll write using, I, I will write cognates. So let's say, for example, I say any cognate, um, mm, gosh, I'm blanking on the cognate, baseball. I mean, for some reason, let's say that they can't figure out what that is, but you know that they would know it if they saw it. So I will just write it down on a piece of paper, baseball in Spanish, and show it to them, and then 99% of the time they get it and we can keep on moving. Um, something else is I will act and I will draw and I will circumlocute for them um, because that's something that I do with them every day in class. Why wouldn't I assess them that way as well? Um, obviously this is not a true OPI, 
you know, a true OPI, they would not be using all of this with you. Okay, so here you have um, a graph that indicates the uh, growth that my students made over the course of three years, or in some cases didn't make. 47% um, of that 86% surpassed their proficiency growth target, while 39% met their growth target out of the 86%, 12% showed some growth, and 2% stayed the same. Um, here you have the actual way that I determine what their grade will be. Um, and the left side on the bottom where it says beginning of the year over here to end of the year. So this is, you know, if this is what they achieved on their diagnostic, this is what I'm asking them to achieve for their end of the year growth target. And then along the way, this is how I determine what grades will be assigned. Um, and then here, this is for intermediate. Intermediates, I ask them to grow by one level, whereas novices, I ask them to grow by two. Um, and I do count the almost levels as a level. Um, and I did set these benchmarks and particularly the end of the year goals um, based off of research and based off of um, my own experience. So if you would like to see what that research was, you can certainly ask me for a copy of the PowerPoint. And in the PowerPoint, I will include live links. Um, I have had some teachers say to me that they feel like these grades perhaps you know, might not be well received um, by, you know, their district or by their head of school or whoever it might be. And um, for me personally, this is just really important to me. I want my students to focus on their habits of mind. I want my students to feel confident, to push themselves, to make mistakes, uh, to be creative, to be risk takers, to think outside of the box to, um, I want them to know that I, I value their individual journey. And for me, this is it. This is, this is certainly, uh, telling them that I value that and that I value their individuality. And I understand that everyone doesn't, doesn't enter the classroom at the same level and therefore everyone isn't going to end at the same level. Um, so what do other students do while I am conducting this one-on-one -on -one interpersonal speaking assessment? Uh, they list, they have headphones on and they're doing some sort of work online. I do make sure that I incorporate choice in that work. Um, how do I keep track? I keep track on, in Excel. I just learned, you know, how to do some of those calculations that you need to do in order to keep track. Um, how do the students keep track? So they listen to themselves, they self-assess, they graph their progress, they use the can-do statements to do a self-inventory and set manageable, tangible goals, and they reflect on their progress. Um, the can-do statements, I have them go through and like line item by line item, depending on their proficiency level. They don't have to go too far beyond their proficiency level, maybe just one level up. Um, and they try and determine with a check plus, what are the things that they, they know how to do really well, a check, what are the things that they know how to do, but maybe need some work on or need some help with. And then they put a G next to the things that they want to set as their own personal goal. Uh, I just like to end by circling back to this spectrum and once again, asking you to consider what elements of the assessment model that I shared with you today you thought uh, fit where on this spectrum. And I'd like for you to um, also consider doing a self inventory for yourself um, and give yourself the gift of grace because uh, as teachers, we, I think, always are well intentioned and, um, you know, we ourselves are somewhere on this spectrum and we have to try and figure out um, if, if that's something that we want to do, like <laughs> how we can uh, improve ourselves and Im improve our own practices. Um, 
And then if uh, you would like access to any of those links that I mentioned, I also have links that um, will help you like practice with how to do interpersonal speaking assessments. Um, if you'd like access to any of the line items here, the students examples, um, for instance, I have her diagnostic and her end of the year speaking exam that I can share with you as an example. Um, in regards to the data, I have a little bit more data that I could share with you. And um, in regards to assigning grades, I can also share with you a semesterly system rather than just by trimester. Um, oh. I'm sorry, not semesterly, quarterly, quarterly, <laughs> not semesterly, quarterly. Uh, so if you don't teach using trimesters, you teach using quarters, I have a breakdown of the progression framework for that. Um, and I just would like to say thank you so much um, for listening, and I hope that you really found something useful here. Um, please feel free to email me. Let me know if you have any ideas for how I could improve. That would be really, really great to hear that feedback. And I hope that you have a wonderful day. Take care.